Yeah, there he is, Professor Dr. Metzel. It's so great to get you back on. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be back. Thank you. Here's what I want to tell you, first and foremost. Of all your degrees and, and your awards and your books and your work, I, I be, I'm being serious with this accolade. It's not one you can measure. Your name and your work gets referenced on shows similar to mine, podcasts, radio shows, TV shows, seminars. Like a lot of people reference your work. I'm sh I'm sure you know that, right? Like you're you're the guy a lot. I mean, I, I've it's plus and minus. Like I, I I don't know if you saw this when when they said the word cracker on the Joe Rogan show um, a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. They flashed a picture of me, um, and so you're the um, official cracker. I'm the I'm the face of Cracker Dome, I guess. So oh, um, I, did, I I have to look that up right now. I have to know what they were talking about in one context. So, I'll send so you you that. Get, who attacks you? Like the I mean, obviously the 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 pro gun crowd, if you will. You know, it's funny that for this book because I write a gun book. Yeah, it, it's kind of like when you're when you're kind of doing what I do. You, it's just like who's going to attack me today? <laughs> so you know, sure. But I mean, is it generally, you know, right wing white gun folk? Uh, I mean, you don't even want to generalize about who criticizes you. And I, I think it matters a little bit, I suppose. Well, it, you know, it certainly matters. I mean, for this book, because I'm critiquing the left also in this book. Right. Yeah, so I've had, I've had a lot of critiques from the left from this book. Um, I've now that I've been critiqued by the left on the right, I can tell you that getting critiqued by the right sells a lot more books. Um, and so when, when Dying of Whiteness came out, I, I was giving a book talk at uh, a bookstore, Politics and Prose in D.C. Oh, yeah, that's and, the one. That means you're a big deal. And the thing is, um, the, um, the Nazis came. Uh, it was the uh, um, literally like nine Nazis came and stormed the, the reading. They disrupted the reading. They had bullhorns and stuff. And, um, and then the book How was. How did you know they were Nazis? They, they all had the same haircut. They had the same khaki shorts. They stood in formation. Um, and then I got a text from Richard Spencer a day later, oh, uh, making I sure know. I identified, the, correctly identified the group. And so they were, you know, they were not hiding it. I'll put it that way. Um, and the my dad's a Holocaust survivor. The Am Dying of Whiteness went to number two on Amazon the day after that happened. I called my dad. I'm like, dad, the Nazis finally gave us something back. Um, and so that was, uh, that was, that was quite an experience. Um, and then I went back to politics and press for this book tour and I'm like, where are the, not like, where are the oh, Nazis? you need the Nazis to yeah, need come that. on. listen, luckily for you, uh, bring them in, bring them in guys, I brought <laughs> a youth <laughs> Nazi group here to help you sell more books. Cause that's, I mean, that's why you got into this racket that you're in. You got a master's, you got an MD, you got uh, a PhD. Um, so you could get rich selling books uh, to, because of right wing reaction. I think that's oh, the I'm, whole I'm loaded. I'm loaded. You know, it's so, really, <laughs> well, I think the most interesting thing about you and I think why people should reference you and your work is because of that kind of ha hybrid background and because of the type of research that you do when it comes to the gun issue, you have bought and sold a public health argument and solution for a long time. You're a public health expert. You know all of the arguments. You understand uh, the culture around it. You've interviewed all these different gun owners. You, to me, and with this book and with your breadth of work, your career, are the guy. You're the guy to listen to. It doesn't mean you're necessarily right, and I'll ask you to you know, make the arguments uh, because I've heard all of them. I've talked to all of the advocates that run the big organizations and so on. But you are uniquely qualified for this issue and argument. I'm saying that so you don't have to brag, but you pick up where I'm leaving off on why you feel like what you're doing and what you're saying in your career is so important to the discussion around specifically gun violence and gun culture in America. Well, it, it's gun violence and, and it's race. race and it's politics. Race. I mean, I, you know, I, I was in. I was in medical school and doing my residency and working in emergency rooms in um, you know the middle of Detroit or in San Francisco, and it made me realize you know I'm I'm offering a medical treatment here, but people are coming in with social problems. Really, the problems that people are coming in with, I'm 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 wanting to treat people and help them, but I also realize that the things people are suffering from are are incredibly upstream issues about racism or inequity or um, food deserts or 
gerrymandering, all these things really had real health implications. And so for me, I, I started as a doctor and, and my career really has been saying, hey man, you know, I, I, I appreciate that I'm in a position here where I'm helping treat people with the tools I have, but I also recognize the tools I have are not enough. And doctors don't know how to fix those upstream issues. And so we need better alliances. And that's been that's been really the frame of my entire career. And absolutely so with guns. I mean, the story of this book in part is about being put in a position of being an expert to have a prescription for the gun issue. Right. And on one hand, assuming that role because I want to help. On the other hand, the more I assume that role, recognizing that the tools at my disposal just were not anywhere near enough to address the complexity of the problem. It's so complex. And, and that's why you really have to buy, well, certainly your last book and this book, because I meant to say primarily, obviously, your understanding on race and what you've written about it and how that obviously is implicated throughout this this book. But let's talk a little bit more about, obviously, where you started or, you know, what where you transitioned. Just real quick, you just mentioned you learned while working in the ER that, that it was really these social problems, these upstream problems. Did that change the trajectory of your career or were you always planning on kind of ending up where you did looking at things these ways? I mean, I, you know, I, my brain always kind of worked like I, I'm this kind of person that like, you're going to tell me there's an answer and I'm going to be like, okay, great. And what else, <laughs> what's your answer leaving out? That's just kind of how I grew up. Yeah, it's great. So certainly I was predisposed to that. Um, but, but I would also say again, that ha I was kind of a humanities social science kid all of a sudden wearing a white coat in an emergency room and people look to you. I mean, you know, and, and understandably, like you don't want to get on a plane and the pilot's like, man, we're having some turbulence. Never seen this one of these before. <laughs> we're all screwed or something like, you know, people look to you when you're wearing the white coat to have the answer. And I, I appreciate that, you know, to, to say, Hey, look, we've got this taken care of. Yeah. But also because I, I did grow up in a particular way. I grew up, you know, with a, in a family that knew the stakes of, political violence. Uh, I grew up in a family that I grew up in Missouri where there were tons of all different kinds of people around and you could kind of see the history of segregation and anti-Semitism and all these things that I never was going to accept. Okay. The answer is penicillin, you know, that just was never going to work for me. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I give the penicillin, don't get me wrong. You know, you want the doctor who knows what to prescribe, but it was also like, okay, but what are the, what are the bigger issues that are causing right. this? So that's just kind of always, how I've thought and 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 I didn't expect to bring that to guns, but boy, with this project, um, I just it, it was just it was so it was so clear the deeper I got into this project that what I was espousing was not gonna fix the problem. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into it because everybody just has to read this book, including I think so many of the people that I interview and talk to on this show and that are showcased in national media who are trying to fight gun violence, who are the most well-intentioned, very well thought out. Sometimes the movement gets caught up in itself and you've got all this momentum on a law or something and you realize maybe that's not the best you know, place to put our, our efforts. But your book, What We've Become, challenges a lot of these assumptions that you, you yourself held, that a lot of us liberals ha ha hold, that gun violence and the prevention of gun violence are best approached by public health experts and policies in towns, cities, states, and as, as a country. But you, you've realized and you provide uh, a whole different kind of point of view or a slightly different, very different, I don't know how you want to characterize it, uh, that it's not just the public health approach. And some of it actually is counterintuitive and does damage to vulnerable communities that you've written about. Right. I mean, I started, and I'll, I'll just say as a kind of kicker that the book tells the story of the Nashville Waffle House mass shooting. Yeah. And it kind of tells the story of the shooting itself, but also how, as I researched the shooting, I realized that my first assumptions, I'm kind of put on the spot to say, we need background checks, we need red flag laws, we need um, uh, assault weapons bans, all the things I say after every mass shooting, public health is a gun violence emergency. I still really believe those things. I would love it if we lived in a country where we had those things, but five years of really unpacking this shooting and what went into it and the before and after of the shooting made me really question the things that I was advocating for, which was, I have to be honest, incredibly difficult 
process. Mm. And if I had to summarize what the argument is in a yeah, nutshell, please do. Uh, yeah, it, it's that you know basically there's an assumption if you come up through the world I come up with through, which is the medical public health intervening into social issues kind of world, which is here's this thing we did against cigarettes. Here's this thing we did against drunk drivers or cars without seatbelts or as housing with uh, asbestos in it, which is we have a playbook, which is first we do the research to show that something is caught, that a product is causing health, bad health effects, injuries and deaths and sickness and stuff like that. And then the second stage is that we, um, we then devise policies and we test those policies to say that our policy interventions can improve and save lives. And then the third part is not only we, do we try to mandate those policies by working with government, but we also use that as a kind of club to bring industry to its knees to say there's going to be a class action suit against tobacco because look, we've got all these evidence that shows that secondhand smoke, you know, causes things. And that worked that worked against tobacco, right? People walk into a restaurant now, and if you smell secondhand smoke, you immediately think, man, that's bad for me. Put out your cigarette. If somebody gets in your car and they don't put on their seatbelt, you're like, dude, put on your seatbelt or we're not going anywhere. Right. But it didn't work. It didn't work with guns. And I'm just open about that. Like, why didn't it work with guns? That's kind of the story of the book. And, and the, the reasons I come to, first, there are some very practical reasons, which is there are different histories of guns. Guns are regional, they're political, they're racial symbols, they have completely different meanings. And so it was never going to be a place where white uh, researchers or liberal researchers from New York and Los Angeles were going to devise policies that were going to tell red state Americans what to do with their guns. That was never going to work. There's also a financial issue, which is that gun manufacturers are, um, are not they're they're protected from liability in in a different way right. than cigarettes right. are, but I think the two biggest ones. Number one is we didn't convince red state America that guns were health risks the way we did with cigarettes and asbestos and stuff. You didn't convince the average red state person that their gun was not. They saw it as protection. They didn't see it like a secondhand sure. smoke or something. So we did not make that argument in a way that was convincing to people. So that's part of it. But the other part is the. the what we were up against wasn't a health argument because the other side was using guns to seat judges and take control and overturn the Supreme Court. It's so clear from the materials I talk about in the book that a health argument was not the right counter. It wasn't the right counter to an adversary that was trying to take control of the country. We needed we needed a power strategy. We needed a judge strategy, and health was never going to get us there. Now, I realize that's a ton coming out of my mouth, uh, but I will just say that those, are the, those are the main points. Yeah, and well done and super important, all of it. And again, this is one of those interviews where I'm like, ah, just read the book. You got to read it. You got to read the whole book because no way to do an interview to – get to all the important points that are made here that are debunked, uh, especially from, again, your point of view being in doing what you've been doing your entire career. But let me just take that to the next logical conclusion. What are the arguments that convince red state America to that we can, I don't know, reduce gun violence? How do we, I don't even know what, exactly what the argument should be made because it's not going to be you can't have guns. It's not going to be we're going to take the guns you do have. And it seems like it's not only, uh, only even going to be those things that even those red state Americans agree to overwhelmingly in polling, like background checks and red flag laws and so on. So what do you what do you think works? You've interviewed these people. Talk a little bit about what you learned. Well, I for the book, I interviewed hundreds of gun owners and politicians and other people. And gun owners are not certainly not one monolithic group. That's right. So I will tell you not to be a super downer. I mean, it's a downer, but even the way you ask the question um, is never going to work. <laughs> and that's because the it's because the frame we put around it. In other words, your question, which was my question when I started this project was, can't we get red state gun owners to see that what they're doing is hurting people? That Can't we come to common cause? I want all those things to happen. I urgently want there to be gun safety reform. I don't back away from supporting any of the policies I ever did, 
But even asking the question that way is just not ever going to work. It's always going to be a protest position because if the goal is talking red state gun owners into seeing the health risks of their guns, um, that doesn't see the bigger issue which is at play. Um, which the bigger issue at play is that the politics around guns aims to control the judiciary and overturn gun laws in places like New York. We saw this, for example, with the Bruin decision that was uh -huh. up from, from 2022, yeah. that the goal is to actually overturn. They're coming for New York. They're coming for Los Angeles. And so talking red state gun owners into finding common cause is not the right response to an agenda. That's The right response is, how can we get judges in place to keep New York gun laws and Los Angeles gun laws? How can we how can we mobilize to protect the judiciary so that blue states can continue to have gun laws? Um, so for me, it's kind of like that question might sound like really far fetched, but that was what the Federalist Society thought 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah they, they absolutely that's what <laughs> they did. And that's why they've that's why we are in this situation. I think you're diagnosing the legal problem. I mean, I don't think many people would argue about right. how we how we got here. But getting, I interrupted you to the the point of the the right question, I guess. Well, so so the, in other words, using a health framework doesn't make you see that we're not facing just a health problem. We're facing a catastrophic, urgent legal and judiciary problem. Yeah. And so, and so part of the issue is if you use the public health frame, which is we want to reduce gun injuries and deaths, which I certainly do. You're going to focus on places where there are the most gun injuries and death, but it, it just, it didn't give us, we have no, we have no theory of power in a way. We have no theory of um, how are we going to stop what's happening? I mean, as we speak, the Supreme Court is likely ruling, about to rule that they're going to legalize bump stocks, for example. They overturned 100-year-old New York gun laws. Um, and in every one of these cases, um, people went into the Supreme Court and said, hey, look, here's all the health data that this is a really... Can I swear on this show? Yes, this is a really bad idea. Um, I'll just say bad. Um, but health arguments didn't carry the day because their agenda was not health. Their agenda was power. And so we've tried to uh, we've tried to refute a power agenda with a health agenda. And it just honestly, it, I mean, I, I want all these things. I want mobilization. I want all these things. But the question we should be asking is right now. How can we protect New York? How can we protect Los Angeles? How can we have judges who are on courts across the country that are going to stand up for common sense safety reforms? It's not about convincing individual gun owners. Um, that That is an important part of it. But for me, it's how can we broaden our coalitions so that more people feel like they're under the umbrella of gun safety so that we can we can have an agenda that is going to stop what I feel like is coming down the pike right now. What specifically is your conversation with the anti-gun violence, the gun control organizations? I talked to all of them, but the young people involved in, say, March for Our Lives or the moms at Moms Demand or my friends at, at Brady or Guns yes, Down. What, what They're is excellent. Yeah. Should they fold up their shops and put it all into getting the right judges on the courts? Absolutely not. No, no. What they're doing is building coalition. I mean, I, I don't think it's like so at odds. And I don't think like, oh, my God, I'm so smart. I realize this thing. I'll tell you where I find optimism. There are a couple things. I mean, first of all, like what David Hogg is doing right now, yeah. um, building an organization that uses the rhetoric of guns to intervene into all these other issues. In other words, like, you know, they're they're running people for school board for city treasurer for election board. In other words, the NRA kind of got its power by running these grassroots organizations that used the kind of Trojan horse of guns to then control all of these levers of local and state power. And I think that David is onto something. Uh, full disclosure, like, you know, where we talk all the time and great. stuff like I'm that. I'm glad to hear it. That's great. Yeah. I think people should listen. You should be in the conversation, in all of the conversations. I'm sure they're very grateful for it. Go ahead. And so part of what he's doing is he's not just saying we just need if we're going to win, if we have background checks, like because we're not going to win if we just have background checks. What he's saying is guns are part of an agenda where we can actually think about ways to rebalance things by running people at local elections, at mid-level elections and kind of building things up that actually 
guns are part of that issue, but it's a much broader agenda that actually has to do with economics and finance yeah. and well-being and equity and all these factors that people understand in a much more material ways. Because I just think the, the risk, the, the problem that people like me have gotten into is there's a shooting, we rush in and we say common sense gun reform is advocating for government regulation on firearms without paying attention to all these other issues about structure, economics, you know, all these things that are much more materially. And so then it's just, it's too easy for the other side to say, oh, well, you're just government regulating. And I've just, I've studied, I talk about in the book, election after election, including the very important gubernatorial election that happened in Tennessee right after the mass shooting I wrote about. And there were six centrist and Democrat candidates who who came in and said, we need more government regulation. And one guy, uh, our Governor Lee now, who said that this is a free country, there should be no limitation, you should be able to have all your power. And that argument, if it's just isolated by itself, it just, it wins every time. And so I'm obviously nervous about the role of guns in the presidential election because <laughs> Trump is saying the same thing that Lee said. So part of the story is a much broader agenda that pays attention to economics, structure, entrepreneurialism, autonomy, all these other bigger themes that often are too easily refuted. Does, does that make sense? I realize that's very It does good. make sense, but let me just try to tell you what I'm hearing. And I don't want to get, I want to get right back to the specifics of the book, but I do have to ask you this because it comes from my own experience. What, Cause what it sounds like to me, you're saying is that we need to organize and do all the things we need to do across all of the issues uh, within the traditional constructs of organizing and campaigning and electing people so that we can get the right people in, in the right places so that we have a broader coalition uh, to create the change and certainly get the judges we need in, in the right places. And what I, 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 what I struggle with is that you may not know this, you probably don't know this, but I'm boots on the ground in my town mm -hmm. is specifically with the school board fight and your prescription. If I'm hearing it right, I would love to think that that works, except for when we do all of that traditional organizing, we've been winning to be clear and we will probably win. I hope again, but we're not fighting someone that's in the same game they're fascists and we're trying to win elections and yeah. they're then spreading they're saying that we said things that we didn't say you know they're 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 assaulting us they're calling child protection services on us to silence us so it's it's very hard to organize in the face of fascism and i'm not being hyperbolic that's exactly what's happening in my town that's no, I, I was very i've been very effective and they've been very effective at trying to silence me it's been brutal I, I don't doubt that. And let me just say, first of all, thank you. We, I mean, we need a million of you doing that. Um, well, I do it for the thanks. I would like you to tussle my hair. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you tussle me back. Um, but um, that was a moment we just had. But uh, oh, man, just in case anybody <laughs> listening doesn't realize, the two white bald guys. Go ahead, though. But the point, the, the answer to the question, I appreciate your. So, so there, there are, I guess there are three parts of how I would answer that. First okay. of all, is to again, just have come i mean i've i've been co-director of a gun safety organization in tennessee for the past 15 years uh, called Sa the safe tennessee project and so on the ground it's it's exhausting it's exhausting yeah. and yeah. and especially when you're up against the kind of things we're up against in tennessee the same thing i mean we're trying to mobilize for all these things and it's just it's almost surreal i mean it's it's definitely not democratic and f people who keep fighting in the face of that we need we need more of that, and so yeah, because I'm not, it's hard to fight people who have guns yeah. and about their guns. They yeah. you're very very afraid that they're going to kill you or someone worse for me and for you, someone that you care about. Like I don't know, I kind of let them kill me. I I I'll be proud that I that I did what I did. Whatever I wanna I wanna be purposeful, but God forbid they do something to your family, and it's it's a horrible scary thing, and it discourages all of us who want to see change, many of us, from getting involved. That's what you're saying. And, and so in a way, like I'm, I, I hope, I, I hope is clear in the book. I'm incredibly supportive and respectful of that work. I'm not trying to say, oh my God, what you guys are doing is wrong in any way, shape or form. Yep. Um, and, but, but, um, and, and I cannot say enough how important the 24 election is like, I'm for whatever works for the 24 election right sure. now. So I'm not trying to, because, you yep. know, if, if Trump has four more years of, 
even of appointing judges, if he does nothing else but appoint judges for four more years, um, it'll set us back another 300 years. And so he's, he's just said today he's, he's going to appoint Hitler's ghost. If it yeah. Like. Yeah. No, it's, it feels and that way. way. Um, and to a lifetime appointment, yeah. <laughs> which is, um, so, um, <laughs> so, so the judiciary part, which again is part of what I argue, we haven't paid attention, but what I'm trying to do in the book, I tell the 50 year history of the gun safety movement yes. just to explain how we got here. It's not to say, oh my God, you're wrong. Or I have some secret formula, like the toy in the box. No, it's an important movie. history lesson about, as you call it, the gun safety movement. Yeah. yeah which starts you know, with Brady or before it. So for me, well, it starts, says, no, what, what, you know, where I tell the story of the book. So I guess, let me just say these three points. The second it's is hard. like 24, do whatever we can for 20 for 24. Cause it's so vital to mobilize. Our networks are so important right now. I mean, they could not be more important, but I guess the third part again is I'm, I'm in part trying to explain how we got here. I'm, I'm in part in the book. I'm just trying to explain how we got here because I think that that understanding is very important. And so after 24, if there is some new gun agenda that comes out of the work I'm doing and other people are doing, it's not just going to be, we want background checks and red flag laws and assault weapons bans. What I advocate for in the end of the book, and then we can go back to what's yeah. earlier, but what I advocate for is an agenda that's much more structural that looks at a different way of looking at crime, for example, is what I talk about. I talk about what I call gun safety entrepreneurialism that ties gun safety much more to um, capitalism in a particular way. I talk about different models of what I call kind of structural approaches to gun safety that really advocate for safety in public spaces. Um, it's not about government regulation. It's about investment in public space and generalizing lessons we've learned in in distressed areas, generalizing those to economic betterment other, other, other places. So my solution ultimately is one where we're pushed less into a corner of advocating for this one policy is going to do that and much more into bigger structural solutions that have economic implications. Again, that's a lot of academic words, but I just want to highlight like where I'm going, which is not to say that people at the incredible people at Brady's and moms and all that are wrong. But I do think that for me, winning, winning is a bigger. A I understand it so intimately. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I fully, fully agree. And you know, you can, everything you want to do uh, hinges upon who wins the presidential election. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm yeah. also hearing. Uh, let me get back to the book and a specific question. I learned so much from reading this and researching it and uh, listening to your other interviews that you've been doing uh and i'm so glad that you've been doing so many and i hope that you continue to and this book gets all the attention it deserves everybody should be sharing uh what we're learning and, and links to buying it but uh specifically it's really been interesting to see the way that the gun manufacturers the gun sellers have strategized and started selling more guns to black folks uh and then as a result using that to sell more guns to white folks now i'm sure as you mentioned uh jewish more jewish people buying guns uh they 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 always win at sales using strategies that are sometimes competing against each other tell us what has happened since say george floyd or wherever how far back you want to go well i i mean i talk about how there's no monolithic gun group that really what the gun manufacturers are doing is creating a arms race in our country um, that in a way when when they got free reign now again everything i'm saying has a little bit of a critique of my side and part of the critique of my side is that we focused understandably after um, what's called the dickey amendment um, in the 90s a research ban we focused almost entirely on gun injuries and deaths we didn't focus enough on what it meant to own or carry a gun which opened up the space for them to create these markets where people could own and carry guns based on really almost no pushback. There was no pushback um, to these open carry arguments. And so what they've created are these markets where it's almost like clockwork. Some political polarizing thing happens. Um, they then market targeted to the people who are the targets of those, of those issues. Then when those people buy, gun, buy guns, then they go back to the original gun owners and say, hey, those guys have guns, don't you want more guns? And so George Floyd's a perfect example. After the police murder of George Floyd, which was obviously caught on tape, 
tremendous marketing to black and Latino Americans on social media saying the cops aren't going to protect you. They could kill you. You better have a gun to protect yourself. And hey, gun ownership is a second amendment right that every American should have. Um, tons of black Americans responded understandably to that marketing. Yeah, it's time for us to go buy guns. There were groups like Black Guns Matter that uh, came up. Protesters had guns. Protesters in places like Louisville after, um, you know, uh, Breonna Taylor and other things uh, um, ha had weapons. So black Americans. Breonna became, Taylor was shot in her house while yeah. she was sleeping by cops. Yeah. 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 And so, and, and so in a way, um, black Americans became the fastest growing <laughs> group of gun owners after, after George Floyd. Um, and then they would take the images of the black Americans with guns and then go back to the white Americans and say, Hey, look, black people have guns. You better buy more guns or faster Amazing. guns or better guns. Amazing. And so, and so that's what arms dealers do, right? They go to one side of the border and they're like, Hey, these guys have guns. And they're like, but by the way, I have a secret gun that those guys don't have. So in a way we've got that. And, and that, that certainly happened after October 7th, Jewish Americans felt unsafe. And so in a way we are in a point now where the feeling of unsafety, the response isn't let's build more community structures, community infrastructure. We're in a moment where that answer is we need to buy more guns. And that logic really, that logic became the logic that has led us to this point. Right? I think, I think we have 500 million civilian owned guns in this country by this point. Um, and we only have like 340 million people. So we have considerably more guns than people. And, and so in a way it's, it's kind of why I think a new strategy is, is warranted. Your work has put you on the map and built tremendous credibility uh, amongst black Americans, specifically black media, black scholars, and specifically in this book, what do you talk about when it comes to race and ethnicity and how gun laws and including even back things like background checks uh, actually make things worse for specifically for black folks? Am I asking that question right? Because I think that no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And the thank you. Yeah. Of all the media I've done beside this interview, which is incredible, um, I had a great conversation with Travis Smiley on Black Talk Radio. I about listened this. to it. I listened to it. Yeah. Nice. And, and to me, to me, that that was, you know, it was a really meaningful, powerful For interview sure. also. also. Um, and, and so in a way, I think that the main points are, again, I, I want there to be, I urgently am not giving up on gun laws. I, I mean, the places where I feel the best, like go to Japan where everybody's kind of playing by the same rules. <laughs> you just feel a lot safer <laughs> walking down the street um, or other places like that. I wish we live in that country, but we, we don't. And so part of the story is why don't we li live in that country? And part of it is about guns. I, I agree with that, but, it, but think about our main interventions in a way there's a, for example, a, a background check is when you go to buy a gun, your name is run through a federal database. And if you're, uh, you have a history of incarceration or um, arrest or something like that. It's going to ping on that background check. Um, and then you're kind of like, oh, should this person have a gun? Um, a red flag law, which is something I totally support also, is that if you're exhibiting behavior that's concerning the people around you, generally you're going to call a police officer or a safety officer who's empowered to come to your house, come into your house, do a safety check on your relative who's then going to bring you in front of a judge to see if you're going to temporarily lose your firearms. And so who among the people is going to ping more on a federal background check, people who are in incarcerated more, who is going to be more wary of having a cop come into their house to do a welfare check on their relative. It turns out um, uh, what I found was black Americans were really not resonating really well with this idea of, getting pinged more or having cops come into their house. And so they were then going to what are quote unquote called illegal markets where you don't have to put up with any of that stuff. You can just go buy a gun or do what's called a straw purchase. And so in a way, this idea that, oh, the bad guys are getting the guns through illegal guns. What I found it was it was also the policies that we had kind of been promoting over the years, which were primarily aimed at liberal gun, I mean, I'm sorry, um, legal gun owners, or keeping suburbs safe, but they didn't really make sense. That's why I said before we need broader coalitions. Part yeah. of the broader coalition is we, we, we didn't for decades, we're doing a better job now, but for decades, we advocated 
positions that were disproportionate and who was being targeted. Now we've, we've figured this out more recently, but I would say that part of my critique in the book is talking to black owners. They're like, I don't want cops coming into my house. I don't want to have to do this federal thing. So it's not just conservative white guys who are like anti-gun control. It was also the policies that we were focusing on, which for understandable reasons were, were crafted after mass shootings to say, we don't want more mass shootings, but for too long. And that's part of the history I tell. Yeah. We didn't tell the racial history of how that was going to lead to disproportionate surveillance for communities that were already being surveilled. And that's why when we needed a broader coalition, we didn't, we didn't, we found we didn't have one. And, and many black Americans don't identify with many gun control policies. And there's a big movement and it's got a lot of different leaders. I mean, I got a lot of black listeners who talk about this issue uh, I've learned from who are gun owners and who are advocating for others to own guns. I mean, I, I hear from them a lot and it's, I'm, I'm here to listen, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, and let me say that I think it's just, I just think it's just important for us to take ownership of why that is the case, which is we made assumptions that were based on preventing mass shootings or on white gun owners in the South that had disproportionate effects. So I, part of the book is like, I just think it's important to recognize why everybody's just not jumping on that bandwagon. And it has to do with like the bad NRA, which is true, but it's also because the policies that I've been advocating for, this was kind of what I recognized. And again, I'm, I'm, I, the book is about a black victim mass shooting. And so this was the story that came out of the sources for me. The Memphis uh, or the uh, uh, Waffle House in yeah. Nashville, Tennessee yeah. shooting uh, guy. I don't really say their names on the, the shooter's name, but people can I do. Up. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. You say it. And so uh, you, you must think it's OK. Well, I think I'm a scholar of race. And in the book, I tell the story. The, the, the main arc of the book is about a mass shooting that happened in 2018. Yeah where a naked white man went into a Waffle House in the black part of town and shot um, eight young adults of color. Um, and so I say his name because I tell his history. His name is Travis Ranking. Because even though I understand that people don't want to give notoriety to mass shooters, saying Travis Ranking's name, as I do in the book, and telling his history of how he got to this point and how his guns got to this point let me tell a story about how his naked white body is a metaphor for a bunch of other bigger racial problems. So I think it's important to tell his story so that I can really tell the full story of what happened in, in, in this mass shooting. I trust you and your judgment and I would not question it. I really, I don't feel that yeah. way about uh, a lot of people, but I definitely feel that way about you. So I'm not going to belabor that one. Uh, but just where time is almost up here and I, I feel like I knew I was going to feel this way where I, I didn't, do a good enough job getting to all the stuff because it's there's just so much important in the way that you write it and and the arc of it all is got to be read in full context but i guess maybe at the end here i mean you already talked a little bit about you know diagnosed the problem and offered some solutions to some extent but maybe just another thing that uh you've changed your mind about well part of the story i mean there there are several stories in the book and, and i appreciate this and let me just say it's been a hard book to talk about in the media, like I was on like one of the biggest NBC shows around and they said, Hey, wait, you're saying gun control is wrong. And, I, and, and I'm like, well, it's not exactly. And well, I tried to they want to, they want to exactly. They got your questions <laughs> and headlines. So that yeah. they can write that so they can get the clicks. I, I, yeah, I don't make that kind of money. I don't no, want to. And, and so it's been, a, so I appreciate this conversation because it's a hard book to so, like dying of whiteness is white people are dying of policies that seem to promote their greatness. End of story. <laughs> this book is how did we get here? Like the initial title for this book is how we lost, which my publisher made uh, me change uh, because, because I was saying, let's just figure out how we got to this point in the gun debate so that we can change course. But they're like, nobody's going to buy a book with lost in the title, <laughs> but it really is a diagnostic book. The title so, is what we become, not how we yeah, lost, what we become yeah. living and dying in a country of arms. Sorry, go ahead. And so there are two diagnoses. One, the main arc of the story is telling the story of this mass shooting and how it should have been a sign of the pathology of armed white America, but instead it became a story about how Tennessee mobilized to reinforce the rights of the, of the 
of the mass shooter. And so part of the story is a, it really goes into granular detail, remarkable detail. I think I got home videos from the family of the shooter sleeping naked with his AR-15. I got access to his internal monologue about all these kind of things. Um, and so part of the story is, is the story of the shooting itself. Um, and then the other part of it is thinking in the bigger gun context about what we could have done different. And, and so in a, in a way, I, I hope people read it to, to see where I'm coming from through the story of this shooting. But then the other thing that I changed my mind about was, um, this is very nitty gritty, but there's, I, I think something called the Dickey Amendment. And it was basically, we, we, bought, we blocked 40 years of gun research we blocked. And so I'm trying to also reread the effects. Well, hold on a second. We didn't like the, 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 just to be more clear, sorry, forgive me, scholar, no, please. Doctor, but we <laughs> 40 years of research. The, the, there's always been this fight that we can research anything that kills people uh, and find out why it's killing people and, and offer solutions and treatments and medicines and so on, therapies. Uh, in this case, the guns are killing a lot of people, but the gun rights, the pro-gun lobby prevented government from doing academic and other medical research on the issue so we could never proper di properly diagnose it. That was an act. That's what you're talking about with the Dickey Amendment. And when you say they blocked research, that that's the fight. The I, fight started in the mid, that right? that start fight in the mid 1990s when there was a rider added to the federal budget, basically in Congress that said that no money can be used to research gun safety. And so we had 40 years of no big grants about how we can research gun safety. And the standard narrative that I've assumed for my entire career is we just needed the federal funds to be able to then research gun death the way we research cigarettes and cardiovascular disease and liver and lung disease, all these things, and then we can come up with safety. But what I didn't realize until I researched and wrote this book is that in the 40 years where we couldn't do this, there was a divide that happened where all the gun research that was still being happened was happening largely in liberal places. So in New York, at Harvard, at UCLA, liberals were doing the gun safety research and they were kind of assuming this idea that therefore when when the funding block gets overturned we can just go down to red state america and impose these these policies but it almost made it too easy for red state america because um they basically liberal gun research was coded as a bunch of liberals coming to tell us what to do mm. and it made it too easy for the nra to, the, to then say liberals are trying to tell you what to do with this deep thing we didn't research what would it mean to convince people in red state america to do the things we're prescribing which we did do in cigarettes we did do in cars but we just didn't do it in guns so we didn't know what it takes to motivate people in red state America. And so it just made it too easy for the NRA to say, this is a bunch of liberals trying to take away your guns because that's the way that's the way it played out. We didn't have enough people in red state gun, gun for structural reasons on our side in a way. And so it just created this red blue divide that made it too easy for people like Trump to say, liberals are coming to take away your guns. And until we try to work against that divide, we're kind of behind the eight ball. Does that make sense? Yes. How do we work against that divide? I mean, you're talking about, I feel like you're still talking about judges and I feel like you're also specifically talking about the Supreme court. So cause well, I'm certainly talking about the Supreme court, but, 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 but in the end of the book, I do have like a 10 part plan for cities and towns and communities to re to use the rhetoric of gun safety, not through government mandates to create economic and structural factors. So I do get into this quite a bit in the end of the book. Uh, I should just read that whole page. I let you, <laughs> should let you go. Not not one page. Uh, that whole section of the book. Uh, I'm literally looking for the page right now. Um, so I'll let you go. And then I guess if there's time again, uh, when I'm done with the book, I mean, I would at this point, I, I, I you've convinced me so much that your view at least needs to be heard by everybody and debated. If not, it's right. <laughs> um, I, I lean with you're right. And I have always felt that way about your work. But I mean, I think every chapter needs to be interrogated and shared. I mean, this Please. needs to be. Can I say one more thing about this? I know we're out of time. And no, I know I'm, not, I'm not the one. With, I have literally, <laughs> I was going to go take, I, you said sleep with a gun. I, I nap with a Dyson vacuum. I'm just, I'm looking <laughs> at her. 
<laughs> I'm looking at her right now. The only thing I have is that nap. So you take as much time as you want. And then well, let me say, let me say to just two things that might make this a little more concrete because it feels so abstract. I get that. But part of the issue is we're, we're in a situation now, again, we need to win the next election. So let's do whatever we can. Yeah. But I feel like we're in a situation now where we define common sense gun owners as people who are willing to play by our rules of ah, kind of- They're not. They're, yeah. And so that defines the few gun owners who are willing to convert to our side, but that doesn't talk to the vast majority of gun owners in places like Tennessee where I am. And so part of what I'm saying is common sense isn't just a, a gun owner who's willing to accept the rules that I think are important for public health. So I just think we need to, part of what I argue is we need to interrogate safety. I learned this in all my interviews when I would tell people, gosh, here's a shooting. Are you willing to like accept background checks? And they're like, why don't you instead ask me what I think needs to be done to make people safe and stuff like that. So I started understanding their point of view a lot more, which wasn't about that. So part of the issue is just there are assumptions embedded in our in our viewpoint that I'm just trying to interrogate, not to say we need to change, you know, not, not to critique the people who are doing incredible work. It's just more for me, like, it just made me think we need to change course in particular ways after we after we win the election. Uh, well, the most important question I did script and have was, I mean, you also, you have an MD and you also, uh, are sociologists. I mean, you, you understand mental health. You've written books about it. Uh, and the most important question, one of the most important questions you, you take on in the book is how much of the issue of gun violence is mental health? Because it does seem like an issue where there's quote bipartisan support, where people think it's a common sense place to focus. I always argue, even if it is the solution and conservatives agree, they won't pay for it. But yeah. you actually argue that it's really like way down the list somehow. And well, I mean, we use data as always. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, um, I, and again, let me just say the book is just so people can rethink what they thought they knew. Sure. And 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 then oh, think about and, and think about you know what are the things we take for granted and how does rethinking what we take for granted how might that help us begin a conversation um, about about how to dig out from ex from this na nationwide problem but also how to protect places that still have <laughs> have gun laws in place which is ultimately my goal here right and so part of it is not falling for the bait of the mental illness trap, which is, I hope people, there are three chapters about mental illness in the book. I hope people by the end of those three chapters, um, they recognize that mental illness is a non sequitur a lot of times. That, it, that Is it, there that any it, controversy in the mental health expert community about this? Well, I mean, people, people, people with mental illness are much more likely to be victims of violence than right. perpetrators of violence. Hurt themselves. M most gun death has nothing to do with mental illness, has to do with 50 other factors uh, and and there's no there's nothing so i certainly agree that many mental many mass shooters including the guy i write about in the book travis ranking was incredibly psychotic but ultimately the reason he was able to commit this mass shooting had much more to do with the fact that he was white that he lived in a state where it was easy for him to get guns that he kept getting his guns back all these other factors were much more much more linked to the shooting than was his mental illness. And so I'm happy to address mental illness, but we should also address the 150 other things that went into the shooting. And so for me, it's like when we isolate it, um, it, it ends up leading us down the wrong path. We, and the wrong path is often followed in this issue because of the, the just uh, crazy spectacle of mass shootings yeah. and the way that they get covered. But if you look at statistics, cold and hard, of who dies of gun violence, a huge percentage, what is it, is suicide. So if what you're saying is true, um, do we not talk about suicide as being a mental health issue? And if most people are that are dying of gun violence are killing themselves, how come that's not a big part of the discussion, mental health? Well, um, was that I an mean, ignorant and stu stupid question? No, no, not at all. M um, most it, gun suicide is not linked to a lifelong history of depression. It's not like okay, Sylvia Plath, exactly. who went to a psychiatrist 5,000 times. The bell jerk made yeah. me mentally ill. <laughs> oh, I hated yeah. that. Like most gun suicide is an access issue. The standard gun suicide story is um, got drunk, got fired, found out your wife was having an affair with the neighbor. Ah, there was a gun there. It, so it's 59 minutes or less at overwhelming oh, wow. impulse and there's a gun. Wow. 
And so no gun suicide is not really a depression issue as much as it is an access issue, which is why a structural intervention like a gun safe, for example, is going to be more effective than, than years of therapy for, for gun suicide. And so it's a perfect example of how something that seems like it's all about mental illness very often is is much better treated with a structural intervention. That's just one of many examples. Yeah, I, that just makes me be beg one more question. I don't know if you have the data at your fingertips. Like what percentage of gun suicide is, is men? Because when you describe that scenario, oh, and, it's yeah. like men. No, no, I, I, it's like 80% men, yeah. over 80% men. But, but again, it's linked to having a gun. The more people who have guns around in moments of crisis, the more those numbers will even out. And so when more black, everybody used to think like, oh, black Americans are safe from gun suicide. It's yeah, they supported gun control for a long time. Uh, women were not gun owners the way men were. The more gun ownership becomes an everybody thing, I guarantee you the more this will even out. It's if you're having an overwhelming crisis and there's a gun available in an hour or less. And so it's it's incredibly, incredibly structural, but it's important to note, and it's good to talk about this because two thirds of gun of gun death is gun suicide. And so, oh, it's yeah, a, no, I mean, I, I, I don't feel I think I had suicidal ideation where you want to die or, or something that's called when I lost my job. It was really horrible. And in corporate media, you know, the greatest job, everything's going great. And I, I didn't have a lot of resilience in my life. And I I think a lot about how I wanted to die at different periods. I didn't want to kill myself. But I do. I did say one time out loud, like in an interview, if I had a bottle of whiskey and a gun on certain days or nights, it would have not been, I don't think I would yeah. have done it, but like, I know that people do and there's data that says, and I think you could probably cite it simply that if you make it give people a day, a lot changes and you're, you're sober and there's no whiskey and you don't, you didn't have access. You didn't, you weren't able to buy that gun, but the fact that you can just go get the gun right now at a sporting goods store in this moment of your depression and you're drunk or whatever. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, so a perfect example.